No, generally speaking, I, t I tend to be a fan of uh, the new translations of the Bible. Uh, some are better than others, um, but my, my favorite new translation is The Message by Eugene Peterson. Um, I think it really speaks well. It does what translations like the Good News Version attempted to do. He does it brilliantly. Um, but sometimes the problem with one of the modern translations is in an attempt to communicate um, effectively, sometimes it strays a little from the original words. And the first reading this morning is, is an example of that. Uh, I'm just going to read a little bit of it uh, again, more later, but a little bit of it again to, to, to give my bouncing off, my jumping off point. Uh, Paul is writing to the Galatians, okay, so the new Christian church in Galatia. And he says this, Now, before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Okay, so that sounds nice. Imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. The version that was read at uh, the 8.30 this morning uh, said, until, uh, until before faith came, we were in captivity under the law. Um, that, I think, is better, but still not right. If you go back to the original language and you read that, what it says is, before faith came, we were in bondage. Okay, That's a different word. And that word has a different power to it. Like imprisoned and guarded, that's, you know, one sense there. Um, in captivity, another nuance, but in bondage. Doesn't being in bondage sound so much more tight with lack of freedom, you know? Um, I... I when I read something like that, I often try to imagine what it was in the Apostle Paul's mind that caused him to write those words down. And so when he's writing to the Galatians, and I'm, I'm going to develop this a little further on, uh, when he's writing to the Galatians, he's wanting to talk to them about the freedom they have in Christ. And he's contrasting it to the bondage they were in before. So what did Paul see? when he first went to that region, and Galatia isn't a town, it's a region, what did he first see that would have caused him to use the word bondage to describe the people as they were before Christ? Okay, so keep that in, in your brain. You know, there's, there's other places in the Bible uh, where we see some of the stars reacting to the, to the state that the people are in. Uh, you can go way back in the Old Testament, you know, when when... Moses is called by God and um, the, the scripture seems to feel we need a reason why God called Moses to go and be his agent of the liberation of the people of Israel from captivity. Um, but the Bible says that God looked on his people and he saw their suffering. He saw their bondage in, in Egypt as slaves and he had mercy. And so that led to the whole Mosaic covenant, like Ten Commandments and all. It was because God saw a people in bondage. Okay, uh, There are other use, words used, servitude and captivity and all the rest, but bondage is one of the words. They were in bondage. They had no freedom, no freedom. And clearly that is contrary to what God wanted. And then, you know, later on, uh, I, I, I could I could go through the whole of the Bible with these, but I, I can't, you know, obviously with time. Um, but you see, Jesus, just before the triumphal entry, just before the week in which we remember the Last Supper, just before the betrayal, just before the, the crucifixion, before the resurrection, we see Jesus just outside of Jerusalem, looking at Jerusalem, and no matter what words you use, you, I don't think there's any way effectively to communicate where his heart was, but the, the words at least point in that direction. He looks and says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Wow, the things you do. I wish I could just collect you like a mother hen collects her chicks and keeps them safe under her wings. So you see in there the passion and the compassion and just the overwhelming desire he has, Jesus has, to just save and protect God's people. What was he seeing there? What was going on? 
Like we know that when he went into Jerusalem, he had this little incident with the, the money changers in the temple that got all the authorities against him. That, of course, had some pretty dire consequences. So that was part of it. But what did he see going on in the streets, you know? And then what did Paul see, just to refresh it, what did Paul see in Galatia that would cause him to enter into the same language of bondage? You know, before faith, you were, you were in bondage. You, you, you had your wrists tied and your feet tied and you couldn't go anywhere. You know, you were in bondage. You know, a number of years ago, um, when we would have like a youth sleepover here or something, we've even done it with adults here, we would do a thing that's called prayer walking. And you can prayer walk, you could just walk down the street and just in your own brain or usually two by two or maybe a small group, just pray for the people that are in the houses you're passing. I used to do that all the time when I was driving, you know. Don't know the people. Uh, but you just pray for people. Um, you walk by business, you pray for the people who own the business. And one time I sent a group to uh, Fairview. And I said, go get a God's eye perspective. You know, go to the second level and look over the rail at all the people that are passing by. Try to see them as God sees them. You know, and it was an amazingly powerful thing. You know, that all of these people have lives and there they are just spending money. You know, and I'm not going to, like, I'm not going to be trashing Fairview and buying things. That's not the point. But they're spending money. But they could be going home to an empty house or they could be shopping with an empty heart. Uh, one of their relatives, or even they themselves, could have a terrible disease, or something bad might have happened during the week. Maybe they're spending money to make up for having lost their job. You know, people do all sorts of things. Who knows what else is going on? But, but to get a God's eye perspective, obviously we don't have God's insight and knowledge, but to get a God's eye perspective is to, to understand that people do live in bondage. To, to, to various and, and sundry things. And clearly, whatever Paul was seeing, he was seeing a people in bondage. You know? And then, then he, he, he goes on, and I'm going to do this part, and then I'm going to come back to bondage, because you know what question I'm going to ask, or I hope you do. Then it says, um, Therefore the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to, dis to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Okay, so he's, he's, he's doing a, a duality here. There's bondage, but then when Christ comes and when you're clothed with Christ, there's a freedom that's consequent to that that sets you free from the bondage that you're in. And then he says something interesting that might give us an idea of what he was seeing in Galatia that caused him to think people were in bondage. He says, after that, you have clothed yourself with Christ. Therefore, there is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Okay? So maybe what he was seeing, and, and, and I, I don't know this because it's not in the, in the book. Maybe he walked in and he saw slaves being abused by their masters. Maybe he saw jihad between the Jews and the Gentiles. We call it jihad now, but it's always been going on under different names. Maybe he saw males oppressing females. Maybe he saw females oppressing males. That happens too, you know, believe it or not. It really can happen. But whatever he saw, whatever specifics, he saw that people were separate. They were in bondage, and that bondage broke them away from each other, tore apart relationships, prevented them from coming together. And he says, now that you've received freedom in Christ, those things are gone. So if you can imagine my image of Fairview again, but in a slightly different way, imagine yourself standing on the seventh, second level, looking down on all the people going by, um, you know, and looking down with compassion. I'm not trying to make you all God or anything, but look down with compassion. 
And imagine the people that the bondage that they're in has an exterior manifestation. And the exterior manifestation I'd like you to imagine in your mind's eye is this. Their hands and their feet are tied together with duct tape. Just imagine that everybody in, who is in bondage, their hands and their feet are tied together with duct tape. How hard would it be to, li to live? Just how hard? How hard would it be, even at Fairview, to shop? You know, let's say you, 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 you just want to buy a trinket. How do you get to your wallet? How do you punch your code? How do you walk into the store? Sort of like, the, 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 what kind of shuffle would that be? Just, just imagine. And you know, I know in one sense you can take this image to the point of being silly. But it's not silly at all. It's bondage. And people are in bondage. Lots of people. And you know what? There's other images in the Bible that we can draw on. Think of the death of Lazarus. You know, where Jesus goes, Lazarus has been dead for a couple of days, <laughs> no bondage like death. And um, Jesus breaks up every funeral that he ever attended, including his own. And he, he says, Lazarus, come out. And I don't want to go through the whole story. I had too much time to the sermon. Um, but Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus comes out. Can you imagine Lazarus bound in his grave clothes? And that's what they used to do. They used to wrap up the body until the flesh decayed. And that's why they had the spices and the sweet smelling stuff because it was decay. And then after the body had decay decayed and the closet collapsed and all that was left was bones, what they would do is they would go and they'd collect the bones and put them in a thing called an ossuary, a bone box. You know, so that's, that's what was expected to happen to Lazarus, right? But instead, he's alive now. He's, he's, you get the theme there? He's alive. And what does Jesus say? He says, untie him and let him go. He's, Lazarus is in bondage. He's like an Egyptian mummy. You know, he, literally. He's in bondage. He's bound up. And Jesus says, untie him. Let him go. So, however you want to describe or define Jesus uh, in terms of liberation and, and all, that's, that's what he does. He, he, he meets us where we're in bondage. Now, at this point, usually ministers start talking about, you know, the big three, you know, sex, drugs, and alcohol. Um, and I will tell you a story about a minister I, I knew. He's passed away now. Lovely man. Man I had a great respect for. Um, and he, tells, he used to tell the story, so uh, I will identify him. Some of you knew him. Um, and I, I, have, I had his permission to tell the story. Murray Magor, who was here as an honorary assistant for a while, when Murray and I were sort of, well, I wouldn't say we negotiated. That would be presumptuous and ridiculous. We were just deciding whether we wanted to work together. I took him out to lunch at St. Bear, and he says, uh, Lauren, I'd really like to, to work with you, um, but there's something I'd like you to know before I do. And I said, oh, what's that? He says, I'm an alcoholic. Okay. And uh, obviously there was a story that was, that was coming. And... Um, this is a very bright man, very intelligent man, a man of faith. But of course, that doesn't protect you from everything in life. And Murray's story was, at a time when the church was going through explosive growth, he was one of the rising stars. He was one of the golden children. And um, he was given new ministries and new things. And he was uh, a minister at Bow Repair when it was just starting, and it was exploding in growth. And... Um, all that that implies, the late nights, the extra meetings, the visiting the new families, the counseling. So he was, he was really, really working. He was married, had kids. Um, his wife um, developed uh, mental illness, mental illness, schizophrenia. And uh, it came on slow, but then it came on more. So home stopped being, in one sense, what one might think was a respite. But home became work as well. And um, he liked his, his, his ministry. He loved his ministry. He didn't want to do anything else. And he loved his family. And he loved his wife. But just the stress of it all began to get to him. And so he would come home from work at the end of the day and have a scotch. 
And over a period of years, one scotch became two scotches. And two scotches became more scotches. And at a certain point, he had a drinking problem. And it was significant. And um, it doesn't serve a purpose this morning to deal with the aftermath of that. But it cost him, as it always does. He, he, he was in bondage to alcohol. Uh, you could also use another word for bondage, possession. Um, alcohol had possession of him. And um, through very proper and, and healthy interventions, um, Murray's struggle with alcohol, uh, which, as any alcoholic will tell you, is a lifelong struggle, even if you haven't had a drink in 25 years. Um, he, he, he gained power, gained a sense of liberation, of freedom from the compulsion uh, to drink. And uh, his wife died, and he, he remarried. Lovely woman. Uh, she's just, just a lovely woman. Um, and his life turned around. But he was in bondage to alcohol, and he needed to face that he was in bondage to alcohol. Um, and that alcohol was taking from him everything, everything that he valued. His life, his family, his ministry, his friends. Uh, it was taking everything from him. And unless that changed, uh, things are very dark indeed. And I so admire and respect a person who can see that darkness in, that, in their soul and have the courage to acknowledge it and to call it what it is and to take responsibility and to then receive the freedom that comes when one enters into faith in Christ. And I've known, and I still know, uh, lots of people in bondage. There are all sorts of things that, um, wow, they could be each be sermons, many sermons. There are people who are in, in bondage to the opinion of others. If somebody has a not so great opinion of them, they are devastated and will do almost anything, sometimes going to ridiculous and sick lengths to win approval. There are people who are in bondage to sex. Um, and I know it's trendy, well, it was more trendy a few years ago, to talk about with the internet people being addicted to porn. Um, I think the danger in making an addiction common parlance is it doesn't speak of the power of something to possess a person. But there are some people that for them, the test of love is, will this person have sex with me? Male and female. And there are people who use their sexuality or the withholding of their sexuality as a weapon to beat people up. Something that was given by God to create relationship becomes something that destroys relationship. And then there are people who are in bondage to fear. And I think that gets to be one of the biggest ones. And we call it all sorts of things. We call it stress. I'm going over time today. We call it stress. We call it anxiety. We call it all sorts of other things. And this is not in any way to say these things don't exist or to trivialize them. Not at all. Not at all. But to say these things have a source. And I think technology can be one of the things in which we are, to which we are in bondage. How many times have we all seen somebody sitting at a restaurant and their phone buzzes because, of course, out of courtesy, they've turned off the ringer. But the phone buzzes and they have to look at it. 
I used to sit with the Archdeacon, at the Archdeacon's consultation and there was one person there who I would say was in bondage to her, her, her cell phone. She could not, not answer it. She just couldn't do it. And despite the fact that we had come to an agreement around the table that, you know, during that meeting, you know, people will leave voicemail, people will leave their texts, and chances are nothing of immediate urgency is going to be on there. She just couldn't not answer it. She was in bondage to it. And I wonder if any of you are in bondage to technology, that you can't live without it. And you know, part of being in bondage is you put other people in bondage to the same thing that you're in bondage with. The company of drunks are other drunks, not teetotalers or not casual drinkers, because it makes you feel better about yourself. The consequence of technology addicts, you want everybody else to be a technology addict. Maybe I chose something wrong to focus on with this group, but maybe not. You send a text, and if the person doesn't answer you right away, you get irritated with them. You get antsy. Why the hell do they have it if they're not going to use it? If you send an email and you don't get a response within 24 hours, why do they have email anyway? You know, I get that, and I'm sure you've all had it at least once. That's bondage, folks. And where you're in bondage, you will put the people around you in bondage. And the final one I want to just mention is emotional. Um, some of us are in emotional bondage. Prisoners to the past. Past abusive relationships. Uh, or past relationships that weren't what you'd hoped. Or past experiences or past calamities. And they have either resulted in overcompensation in one direction or seizing up in, in the other direction or a plethora of everything in between. Bondage to emotion. And you know what? If you're in bondage to your past, if you're in bondage to emotion, you will inflict that on the people around you. Sometimes people see it as, wow, he's a rather selfish, narcissistic person. Oh, wow, she is a really needy person. Wow, he dumps his trash all over everybody else. Wow, she's hypercritical. Wow, he really thinks highly of himself. Wow, look at their children. They're just like mom and dad. Bondage. Paul walked into Galatia, and there was something about what he saw that said, you know what? These people are in bondage. We don't know what it was, and perhaps it's best that way. But he said to them, by faith in Christ, you are set free from that, or you can be set free from that. Jesus will cut the duct tape that's holding your wrists together and your ankles together and set you free so that instead of just hopping around from place to place, stumbling, fumbling, and falling, and making the best of the bruises and saying, oh, well, I guess that's life. You can do what Jesus wants you to do, which is the freedom dance. Now let's pray. Lord, there's lots of people we know who are going through a lot of things. Um, before I was talking about Nick, so we pray for him, that in the time that, uh, that, that, that this has come on him, you'll find peace in you. We pray for the doctors, the medical staff that will be uh, dealing with him and treating with him. And we pray for Ruth too and the rest of the family. We pray for Leanne and her whole family and her boys. It's got to be a scary time for them. Help them through it, Lord. And be with Cliff as well. And Sally and Dave and the girls and the rest of his family. And God, we pray for our world. 
Uh, it seems like there's a disaster a week that we're praying for, whether it's a plane crash or something to do with refugees or the situation, what happened in Orlando this week. I wonder how many clergy today in their sermon, you know, neither slave nor free, male nor female, Greek nor Jew, also put gay or straight in there. So we pray for our world and pray that you also, Lord, liberate us from the bondages that we're in. And now we'll take a minute or two of either silence or to pray out loud as you wish for something you're concerned about or someone you're concerned about. Jesus, you are liberator. You promise to free us from all that holds us captive. We claim that in your name and in the name of those whom we love. Set us free to dance. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.